you'll hear a conversation between two students in the dining hall of the college. First, you have some time to read questions. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions. Hi, Max. How are you? Hi, Melanie. I'm fine. In fact, I'm preparing the coming holidays, and I want to have a car tour with my friends. That sounds lovely. How is your preparation? Well, I haven't begun yet because I'm not quite sure how to rent a car and what the expense is like, and something like this. Ha! <laughs> You've run into the right person. I did the same last holiday, and I can recommend it to you. I went to Avis Rent a Car Company, which is at 14A Dover Road, Oxford. Let me write it down. Is it D O V E R? Yes, and the telephone number is six three four zero nine six three. But if you book for the first time, dial another number with extension. That is six three four zero eight five three. Extension fifty four. Okay, thank you very much. I'll have a try. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions. Now listen to the conversation between Max and the assistant. Good morning, Avis Rent a Car Company. How can I help you? Hi, I want to book a car for tour. I want to inquire some information about the grade of the cars and the prices. No problem. We offer a wide selection of rental cars to choose from, from luxury car to economy car, compact car, minivan, and pickup truck. Well,、uh, luxury car is obviously out of my price range, but compact or economy is not big enough. You know, we have seven persons together. Well, how about a minivan? It's perfect for road trips and will make your journey feel like you are in a living room on wheels. I think that's good. Well, what does it feature? I, I mean, what facilities does it have? Unlike most minivans with manual transmission, the rental minivan cars have feature automatic transmission, air conditioning, and AM/FM stereo. If you drive a long, smooth way, you can use the cruise control, which will save you a lot of energy. Good. How much is the price? If you rent an intermediate one, it will cost you fifty-five pounds each day. If it is standard, the cost is forty-five pounds per day. I think the standard is enough. Oh, we have a special fifty percent discount for weekends from Friday to Sunday, but that doesn't apply to tax, recovery fees, and optional services. Well, what are the optional services? Well, they usually include some extra facilities like first aid kit or something like that.、Uh, I know. We plan to start off on Friday, so we have to prepare one day in advance. I want to book from thirtieth of April, which is Thursday. And it will end next Monday. Okay. Could you leave your name and the driving license number? My name is Max, and the license number is M nine zero two one. Okay. You can pick up the car on Thursday noon. Besides, we offer some optional services like street maps, flashlight, and sun sheet. What would you like to have?、Mm, flashlight is not necessary, I think. But street maps are useful, especially when we drive in a strange place. As for the sun sheet, I like to give that a miss. We don't want to spend too much extra money. Okay, Mr. Max. Thank you for calling. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students and their tutor discussing a survey project. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. So, what's the survey about, Tom? It's about where students want to live and how they choose. Basically, their accommodation preferences. We've actually tried it out with a few students already. Okay, that sounds fine. So, to start with, how many questions have you got? Twenty.、Mm, Is that too many? Yes, it is really. People get fed up answering lots of questions, and they stop thinking about their answers. Right. So we need to think about that again. What do you think of the first three questions? Um,、uh, you want to know what affects students' choice of accommodation when they go to university? Yes. We want to find out which has the most effect: the cost, the number of rooms in the house or flat, or the distance from campus. And then we asked another question. Oh yes, what else did you want to find out? Well, we wondered whether public transport was important. You know, not many students have cars, so it might be quite important for them to be near somewhere where they could catch a bus or train. Yeah, that's a good question. Before you ask any more people, I've got a couple of suggestions for improving the questionnaire. First of all. I think you need to ask fewer questions. As I said, twenty is really too many. I'd cut it down to ten if I were you. Okay, ten questions only. And is there anything else you think we should do? Well, yes. Some of the questions are actually quite complicated. I think you should make them clearer. I mean, I think they should be easier to understand. And what do you think about asking more questions about cost? No. I don't think you need any more about cost, but you could ask a couple more questions about the reasons for students' decisions. So we should ask some more questions with why. Yes, I think you'd get quite a lot more information if you did that. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Um, we've already got some results from our first questionnaire. Do you think we could use them? I don't see why not. What have you found out so far? Well, the number of rooms was only important for sixteen percent of the people we asked. It looks like a lot of students are quite happy to share a room, and even fewer people were concerned about being near a bus stop. Uh, only ten percent, in fact. I'm surprised about that. But what about the distance from the university? Well, that was quite important. Around twenty percent of the students we asked wanted to be close to campus. Hmm, that makes sense. And what about the cost? <laughs> yeah, as we expected, the cost was by far the most important factor. More than half the students were concerned with the cost. Fifty-four percent, to be exact. Only fifty-four percent. I thought it would be closer to eighty percent. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. We'll hear a discussion between three students, David, Joseph, and Carrie. In the first part of the discussion, they will be talking about lounges in different school buildings on campus. First look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Hey, Joseph. Long time no see. How's it going? Oh, hey, David. It's going fine. I'm a little overwhelmed with all these new courses, but I'm hanging in there. Have you met my girlfriend, Carrie? No. Hi, Carrie. Hi, David. Joseph told me about you. You two had quite the time last semester in European history, I hear. Yeah, we like to hang out after class. Now it's a little harder, though. Lounges aren't as good as they were back there in Wilson Hall. Yeah, they had chairs, couches and tables to put your stuff on. And that lounge was full. There must have been 25 seats in there. Really? The lounge in Jones Hall, where I have my communications course, only has about ten chairs. It's awful. We all just stand around or leave. I wish we could hang out more. Well, Agriculture Hall is next door. Their lounge is on the first floor, and it has couches. I think there are about six of them. And they're comfortable, and hardly used at all. That's not a good idea. Thanks. But don't go to lounge at Skidmore Hall. I don't even know why they call it a lounge. It's just four chairs in the corner of the main walkway. In the second part of the discussion, David, Joseph and Carrie continue talking about conducting a survey. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Guys, we should really do something about those lounges. I mean, couldn't we gather signatures and try to get the university to improve some of the facilities? Yeah, that's a great idea. But we can't just say something random like, oh, you need to make the buildings nicer. We should come up with some kind of ranking system and have students rank buildings, how beautiful they are, how nice they are, etc. Well, if we were ranking on a scale of 1 to 3, you all know that I would rank Skidmore Hall a 1. Like I just said, that place is awful. No facilities. The bathrooms are way down in the basement. You're right. But they do have a nice balcony on the third floor. That might increase its value. But you shouldn't rank the architecture. You should rank how nice the building is for students to hang out in. Oh, OK. Then I agree with you. So should we do this? I think it's a great idea. But let's try it ourselves on a couple buildings so that we can work out any bugs in it. I think Wilson Hall is the best. Sure, but we've already begun. We will give a building one point if it has poor facilities, not enough chairs and no vending machines, that kind of thing. And give a building two points if it is OK or acceptable. We can rank buildings that we really like as having three points. So like Joseph said, I think Wilson Hall is the best. It should have three points for sure. And Skidmore has a one. Now what other buildings should we rank? How about Merris Hall? No, they're not done with that one yet. But it looks like that will be a good place to hang out. How about Agriculture Hall? 
You said something about that hall a bit earlier. Oh yeah. They have that lounge with couches that no one uses. But that might indicate that people don't hang out there for other reasons. They don't have any drink machines. That's why I never go there. Oh, well, then I think it's an average building. Let's give it the middle ranking. I agree. It could be improved slightly, but it's got a couple of nice features. I like that lounge in that third floor, for example, but the stairs are too short. I always trip when I'm walking up them. This ranking is getting complex. Okay, one building we haven't talked about is Canton Hall. What do you guys think of Canton? Is that next to the law building? Yep, it's got this excellent connecting corridor with chairs and desks to relax and work at. The cafeteria there is great too. I think that place is just as good as Wilson. Well, I've only been there once, and didn't know that was what it was called. It was kind of confusing, and it's kind of far for me to go, but I liked it, so I'll give it the middle ranking. Two points because it had nice facilities, but a poor and confusing layout. Oh, Joseph, you like Canton Hall? I hate that place. It's so mechanical, cold, and impersonal. The furniture is nice, sure, but it's the last place on campus I would go to. I give it a one. Interesting. Well, let's write this little survey up and start passing it around. I don't have time to type it up. Can you? Sure. I'll do it after my biology class. Should we meet up at Wilson tonight around eight? Sure. No problem. We'll see you then. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the solar eclipse in history. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty one to thirty six. Good evening and welcome to this month's Observatory Club lecture. I'm Donald Mackey and I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago, a total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience. But these days, an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will travel literally miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse when the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day? Scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. It's the shadow of the moon streaking across the Earth. This happens every year or two, each time along a different and, to all intents and purposes, a seemingly random piece of the globe. In the past, people often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster. And in fact, the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods one whose job it was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you're superstitious or take a purely scientific view, 
Our earthly eclipses are special in three ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt that they're very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain had fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. Only during an eclipse can we study the corona and other dim things that are normally lost in the sun's glare. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on Earth every year or two, if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it were smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an 18-year pattern in their occurrence, but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. In the second part, the speaker talks about a number of scientists. Look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen carefully and complete the table. It was Edmund Halley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet, which incidentally bears his name, and in 1715 he became the first person to make an accurate eclipse prediction. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they've since allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists, Janssen and Lockyer, were observing the sun's atmosphere, and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium, after the Greek god of the sun. This was a major find, because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved Mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, there's Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, then Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he'd spotted this so-called lost planet. But, alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he'd been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that, rather than being wrong about the number of planets, astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he's so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit. He also realized that a definitive test would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when his theory was finally proved correct. So, there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now let's move on to the social aspects. And I think you'll find... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.